excited. It's me again. In part one of this video, we discussed the basics and a little bit of history behind what a VOR is. Now we're going to discuss the technicalities behind how VORs work and how they tell us where we are in space and how far we are from them. Strap in because you're watching episode 8, part 2 of Toolkit. Now here comes the technical part of the video. How exactly does your aircraft know your distance from a VOR or the bearing towards the VOR? We'll get into that. For starters, all VORs can tell you your bearing towards the VOR and tell you what radial you're on relative to that VOR. In addition to this, some VORs can also tell you the distance between you and the VOR in a slant range distance. This method is known as DME, or Distance Measuring Equipment. DME works by sending out radio waves in what's known as an interrogation pulse. Once the DME equipment picks up that interrogation pulse, it will reply with a reply pulse. The time it takes for the round trip between the interrogation and reply pulses allows us to calculate how far we are away from that particular ground-based navigate. Just think of it like sonar in a submarine or echolocation with bats. It's the exact same concept. The most important thing to remember about DME is that it measures slant range distance, or the physical distance between the ground-based nav aid and you. I'm sure you're probably wondering, why does the slant range distance even matter, and what does that even mean? Well, think about it like this. If you're flying at 6,000 feet AGL, and you're 40 miles away, the difference between your horizontal and slant range distances is going to be negligible. Now let's say you're 6,000 feet AGO and you're directly over the ground based nav aid. Your horizontal distance is zero, but your slant range distance is going to be 6,000 feet or one mile. For this reason, when your horizontal distance from the ground based nav aid is less than the vertical distance between you and that same navy, you can consider yourself inside what's known as the cone of confusion. Inside of the cone of confusion, bearing and heading information is no longer reliable. You must continue until you are beyond that point and exit the cone of confusion before you can start relying on the bearing and heading information from that VOR, TACN, or VORTAC again. An easy way to determine when the cone of confusion starts is to divide your altitude by 6,000. The resulting number is the distance at which you expect for your bearing and heading information to become unreliable or finicky. Obviously this technique breaks down as ground elevation increases, but it's a good starting point for you to start considering when to expect the cone of confusion. In addition to DME, VORs, TACANs, and VORTEX also broadcast an azimuth frequency. An azimuth frequency allows your aircraft avionics to determine where the ground-based nav aid is in relation to where you are. This system works by having both a variable and a reference phase. In extremely simplified terms, the system works by first broadcasting a reference signal. The reference signal is broadcast in all directions. Once the aircraft receives the reference signal, it begins timing. The VOR then broadcasts the variable signal. While the reference signal was broadcast out in all directions at the same time, the variable signal is broadcast in a directed wave. This signal is first broadcast out to the north and then rotates all the way around east, south, west, and then back to the north. Just like you'd see on the old sonar scopes. Once the sweep is complete, the VOR broadcasts another reference signal and the system repeats over and over again, hundreds of times a second. The aircraft is able to calculate the time between the reference and the variable signals to determine its position relative to the VOR. In part one of this video, we discuss the VOR service volumes for high, low, and terminal VORs. As you can now tell, the broadcasting power of the VOR determines its service volume. But one thing all ground-based nav aids, whether it be a VOR, TACAN, NDB, ILS, localizer, all of them are limited by line of sight communications. What this means is that VORs that are located near mountains or other dense objects like buildings 
may be unusable from certain angles. Let's take a look at the airport facility directory for the Upper Cumberland Regional Airport. The particular VOR we're looking at is the Hinch Mountain VOR located in Tennessee. As you can see here, the VOR appears to be located atop a mountain with an elevation of about 3,000 feet. So if the VOR is located atop a mountain at 3,000 feet with no obstructions, why is it that from some angles, the VOR is unusable at altitudes as high as 6,300 feet? This leads me to my next point. Not only do dense objects like mountains and buildings block radio communications altogether, in some special instances, they can reflect and refract radio waves, much like a light on glass. So this is why mission planning is critically important when navigating in mountainous terrain using VORs or other ground-based navigates. You have to do your research beforehand or else the VOR could give you very confusing signals, cause disorientation, and lead you into a CFIT controlled flight into terrain situation. Once again, my friends, it is that time of the video. I hope you learned something today because I sure did researching this video. If you haven't already, go check out part one of this episode where we lay out the basics and a little bit of the history behind the VOR DME systems. As always, please continue to share this content with whoever you think needs it. Please continue to hit the books, stay safe, and I'll see you out there later.